Hey guys, what's up? It is week 359. I got some reviews for you and a small little update, so let's hop into this. First up is the second release from Neon Eagle, which is kind of like a sub-label of Cauldron Films, and this is Zero Woman's Red Handcuffs. Now, this is a Pinky Violence film. Uh, Pinky Violence is essentially kind of like Toei's answer to the Nakatsu Erotic Films in the 70s, and this one is 1974. They kind of have a little nice featurette about Pinky Violence and this film and everything like that on the disc, but essentially what we have here is uh, a police officer in the beginning is supposed to arrest some like uh, American diplomat or you know Western uh, diplomat and because he's a horrible person that uh, has done some bad things to her friend actually killed her but what happens is when our character gets the upper hand she decides to waste him she gets sent to prison but at the same time there's a group of thugs who just got released from prison the leader and they decided to carry out a gang rape in celebration. So the person they picked that they gang rape, uh, they kill the boyfriend and take her back to sell her into prostitution with kind of their uh, their sixth member of the gang, kind of this woman who you know helps with those kind of things. And it turns out she is the daughter of a famous person who is running for political office. So they decide to hold her for ransom. Uh, this kind of triggers that uh, the, the kind of guy who's basically kind of a secret police officer is telling this politician guy the odds are that they're going to kill her if after they get the money. So they hire uh, this police officer who just got sent to prison, um, you know, red handcuffs, to kind of infiltrate the gang, take them out, kill them, kill everybody, and save the girl. That's her only mission. So that's essentially what we have here. There's a lot of double crossing. There's a lot of twists and turns. There's a lot of rape, of course, if it's a pinky violence film. There's a lot of, you know, nastiness, a lot of blood splatter. Overall, this is a really great one. Great lead performance. Great look from our lead here dressed in soul red uh pretty much all red with her red handcuffs and her little red uh hidden gun she's got a lot of cool stuff going on the bad guys are absolutely ruthless um the movie i think is going to be pretty straightforward revenge film but it, it goes to different places adds in set pieces has flashbacks for our main villain which are kind of unique and interesting and the ending kind of has like a western flair being in this kind of deserted little shitty town with trash blowing in the wind uh yeah overall this is a good one and uh the commentary by Sam Deegan, the featurette. They go through a lot on here. They start talking about how basically this movie right off the bat kind of says, screw like all the the the, the the pre-established things like family and government and police it's all corrupt it's all shitty and you're like wow this movie really does say a lot in it it has a lot more to say than just being an exploitation film and the featurette does point out things which are interesting because they say it's kind of having your cake and eat it too and I, that's how kind of i explain humanoids from the deep right it's it has a feminist stuff in it but at the same time at the end of the day it's an exploitation movie because you have these two kind of mergings so you know like the, the a lot of the artistic side of these people the writers and the, the filmmakers sometimes they want to put other things in there like feminist things or cool ideas or anti-government anti things or point out these horrible things within society but at the same time you know they give you these like crazy things that just keep you invested because you can't believe they're doing it like the incredible violence or or the sexual stuff and you're like wow this is pretty intense stuff so you you're focused on that stuff sometimes you don't even register that this other stuff is going on as well um you know that's why a lot of times exploitation movies are the first ones to do something like that or to say something like that with Although they can be ham-fisted if you're paying attention, not always. They don't always come across that way. But it's a good, well-acted, good cast in here. A bunch of recognizable faces that you see in a bunch of these movies. The bad guys are ruthless and memorable and nasty. Um, There's a pretty high kill count. And uh, yeah, it's, it's memorable as hell. I really enjoyed this one. This is Zero Woman's Red Handcuffs. It looks fantastic. It's a 4K restoration. I would have never guessed it was 74 if you were just to show me this. I would have said it's definitely an 80s film. But as far as the special features are concerned, we have audio commentary by film historian Sam Deegan, Sex Plus Violence, Peaky Violence, Tokyo Scope, and author Patrick uh, Machias. Uh, how do you say that? Machias on Zero Woman Red Handcuffs. Yeah, great movie, great release. Check it out from Neon Eagle. Okay, the next one up is from 88 Films, and this is the sequel to The Inspector. Inspector wears skirts. The inspector wears skirts part two. So if you've seen the first one, I feel like these are the equivalent to like 
the less silly versions of Police Academy in, in Hong Kong. And I know that sounds really weird, but the first one essentially is a group of girls and guys competing to see who the best are. They even have like this whole martial arts tournament in there, and it's like zany and goofy and funny, and then this, the last part of the movie is them on a serious mission. This time we have a bunch of the same cast coming back, including the lead instructors for both the male and female group. And what happens here is we have some of the same troops in here. I don't think all of them are in there, but we introduce like four new people in here that are not not gonna merge well with the old ones so then we have all these kind of hijinks ensue and we have a lot of the same stuff going on here we have this petty competition we have a lot of the same characters that that whole arc with the two characters that are kind of like have a thing for each other on the male female side we're constantly beating the shit out of each other and they hate each other that continues on in here we even redo the whole martial arts tournament thing you know for american audience i i would say like have you guys seen austin powers one and liked it and then they made austin powers two and you're like okay that's more of the same maybe a little better maybe a little worse in parts this is kind of that. This is almost identical to the same movie. Uh, the end. The end kind of a. Uh standoff is cool because it, it, it kind of like uh it, it's more outside at less jewel heist you know it's more like the jungle kind of thing or or but it's 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 more similar uh, i mean like it is literally kind of identical there's some clever things the way that that they like throw the bad guys off and everything like that but overall it's mostly a comedy kind of silliness and then the last third of the movie is kind of a mission thing like i would say stripes or in that kind of vein you know uh, as far as the special features are concerned we have um, audio commentary by uh, Frank Chin, um, an interview with Stuntman Mars, le leading the top, an interview with director Wilson Chin, interview with Stuntman Go Shut Fung. And I mean, the stunts are great, the action's great, that's all in there. And I really like the uh, the showdown and the, the kind of relationship that they have that both the kind of male guys are both competing for the female lead in here. And uh, one is just vastly superior in fighting and everything, and the one's kind of a dork. He, he's kind of always misinterpreted as like a pervert, but by the end of it, she actually has some sympathy for him, and it kind of seems genuine and seems natural. But this is The Inspector Wears Skirts Part 2. Enjoyable, nice release from 88 Films. Okay, the next one here is from Dark Force Entertainment, and this is a Greek film called Assignment Skybolt. And I must admit, I am not the hugest fan of, like, the, the spy movies, the James Bond kind of, the riffing thing, you know. Um, so essentially what I have here is a guy who goes on this secret mission. He's trying to find a missing bomb. There's a bomb. He's trying to figure it out. He kind of infiltrates this hotel, and he starts meeting these these kind of mysterious femme fatales. There's this really heavy set guy that's like he looks kind of like Gorbachev meets Alfred Hitchcock, and he's sitting in the corner, and he's he's on to him, and all this kind of stuff like that. Overall, you know, this movie is is kind of a kind of a dud for me. It's kind of dull, but I'm not the world's biggest spy guy. Even stuff like Contamination, which has a great opening and and, and great ending, has that middle big kind of James Bond stuff, and and I don't eat it up. Some of the Bond movies I, that I have seen, I do like, but th those are like cream of the crop. So, like, I'm watching this kind of movie dubbed in English from Greece, and I like the locations, and some of the side characters are okay. There's plenty of, you know, I guess good-looking people, and a lot of, like, I guess sexy time, double-crossing, but overall, there's also a subplot with the guy's missing brother, and a, gu and a guitar, and that stuff is okay. Overall, this is not my thing. There's a good sight gag in here in a graveyard when you read one of the tombstones pretty funny stuff besides that i really got a pass on assignment skybolt i just think it's not really my jam i think that the cast is okay i think that for the most part it, it comes across kind of dull and kind of you know like if you look at something like what is the um uh, film that uh, Jack Arnold I just covered a, a little bit ago um, the the Swiss conspiracy like that's a good spy film action film conspiracy kind of film because the cast is so good right this one needed a good cast it needed familiar faces it being Greek from Greece and dubbed in English doesn't help you know pop for me it doesn't have any real memorable lines it's kind of clunky but uh, it's not the worst film ever made. it's not like poorly made it's just not really my story not really my jam um, there's not really any special features on here um, it, it's it's brand new 4k so it looks really solid I guess from a 35 millimeter you know it's not a movie to me that is like some spectacular like world beating movie anyways on the visuals but uh, yeah there's some trailers and everything like that that is assignment skybolt okay the next up here is from on macabro and this is brigade of death aka death squad now they sent the blu-ray for me to cover I picked up the 4k and that's what I watched it looks excellent on 4k unfortunately out of print so you have to watch the blu-ray but this is death squad aka 
Brigade of Death. And I've covered this film before. It's a 1985 French exploitation action film. And this one is bonkers. This is a really awesome film, to be honest, if nobody's ever seen this one. And I, I'm really happy that it's getting a wider release. So essentially what we have here is a police officer who's kind of like, a, he kind of goes undercover and everything like that. And he sort of starts to get mixed in this case with these four like ruthless criminals. Um, all four of the criminals in here are super memorable, super crazy. One is named Fat Lewis, and frequents prostitutes a lot. And these guys have their hands dipped in drugs and, and all that kind of stuff. They're dealing with this guy they call the Greek, who's a really powerful crime boss. And they, they, they don't play fair, so the Greek doesn't really particularly care for them. They also deal with prostit prostitutes, and they were hired to carry out a hit. They killed more people than they should. They just did a sloppy job. They're not great guys. In the very beginning of this movie, there is some, you know, um, people that are murdered, these prostitutes in this park, which are brutally murdered. They have this point of view shotgun thing going on, which adds a sense of realism to them. In fact, a lot of the action is shot in that way, except towards the end of the film, like some of the action and the murders and kills and stuff, they actually turn to the kills less, more like action. People are getting hatchets to the face. They're getting their hands chopped off. They're getting stabbed in the throat with knives. It turns into this almost slasher-esque brutality at the end. The bad guys in this movie are fantastic. The cop is solid. He's pretty much kind of a man on a mission. Uh, essentially, they start picking off people that are involved with this case that could know who they are, involving, you know, close relatives of his, and that pisses him off, so he starts going on a vendetta. There's a great scene between him and the chief, where the chief knows exactly what's going on, but the chief has sympathy for him because he lost his son in the line of duty, and he's sitting there at the table with him, and they just have this great back and forth where they look at each other, and the chief in here is excellent. Besides the villains, the chief stands out big time. But uh, the bad guys ride around on motorcycles, and uh, they just carry out chaos. There's a scene where they go in this coffee shop to kill somebody, and they annihilate every single person in the coffee shop, and it just is, it's a sense of just, ugh, it just makes you so uncomfortable and just wrong place, wrong time for these people. People, not coffee shop, a bar or whatnot. And the end climax is insane. Incredibly violent uh, uh, stuff here with hands being hacked off, like I said, and hatchets in the face and knives in the throat, um, explosions. Like I said, the main bad guy is absolutely unhinged. He could he could be the lead of his own movie, you know. He's like out of Nighthawks or something like that, or just even more so. He's just a great 80s villain. And I was always the first one to kind of complain about French, you know, action and some of those like really low rent exploitation films. But the action in this movie is top notch. It's perfect. It's well done. It's it's just really, really fucking good. Um, just top notch action. Great plot. Super sleazy. I love that they got the bad guys on the cover over here. If you can see that, uh, yeah, they're just, it's just a really excellent film. As far as the special features are concerned, we have, um, we have English and French. I would recommend watching this in French. The English dub, you know, it, it takes away from it. Interview with Terry D. Carbonese. I can't say that. That's the lead actor. Interview with Olivia Druton. Interview with John uh, Claude. And yeah, so uh, this is a great movie. I would highly recommend this one. Great bad guys. Great deaths. Uh, just intensity all the way around. Looks great in 4K. Blu-ray looks really good too. Would highly recommend checking out Death Squad, a.k.a. Brigade of Death. One of my favorite uh, movies that I've seen a couple years ago. I would recommend checking this out. I think that if you have never seen this, this would be a real treat for action fans, sleaze fans, 80s crazy fans. This is perfect for you. All right, let's hop into those 1982 movies. things and you just attack me right now so some of you are still human this thing doesn't want to show itself it wants to hide inside an imitation it'll fight if it has to but it's vulnerable out in the open if it takes us over then it has no more enemies nobody left to kill it and then it's one Son of a bitch, you moved to cemetery, but you left the bodies, didn't you? Just 
son of a bitch, you left the bodies and you only moved the headstones! You only moved the headstones! <laughs> What's in the basket? Stop it, there's no more time. You've got to please stop it. Stop it now. Turn it off. Turn it off. Stop it. 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 Okay, let's hop into this. We have a couple kind of slasher-esque movies here. The first up is from Vinegar Syndrome. This is Who Done It? AK Island of Blood. I actually think I have a couple Who Done It's up here. Here we go on VHS. I might as well show you these right now. We have a Who Done It here. There we go. VHSs of Who Done It. I want this. I wonder if they're actually the same film. You know, they could be completely different movies. I think this one is actually a different film here. So that's kind of interesting, right? I think two different whodunits, which is very interesting. Uh, the one Vestron release is the actual one that we're talking about here. So I've actually never seen whodunit. This is the first time watch for me. I had heard about it, of course. You know, being a fan of slasher films, you kind of hear about everyone, even the little obscure ones. So what we have here is a film crew that is going out into this island to shoot a movie, of course. And it's full of a bunch of weird people, including the writer, the director, the producer's coming on a boat shortly. And, of course, there's kind of this guy who is supposed to be the caretaker of the island. He's a sleazebag. He's your typical, I'm angry red herring guy. And I could easily be the killer because I don't want none of you punks on my island. You'll eat what I give you. So, pretty soon enough. The movie opens up with a murder, and you, they have this gimmick where there's like a tape recorder, and they play the tape, and it's like, boiled alive, stabbed alive. Every time it sings something, that's how the person's going to die. So there we go. Uh, essentially what happens is, after after they get here, uh, people start getting picked off pretty quick. The characters are not great. I'm going to be honest. They're kind of, eh, whatever. They're whatever. They're not perfect characters. They're, they're kind of silly. There is kind of a funny bit with the writer realizing that the lead actress is terrible, and the lead actress is one of the main characters, so that's fun to have a lead actress character who can't act within the movie she's supposed to be in, but she's okay actually in the movie. But uh, as people start getting picked off. One person gets boiled alive in an overheated swimming pool. Yeah. I, okay, guys, I know we're trying to be creative with deaths, but whatever. People get hacked up, and there's a pretty gory death. One of the characters pl gets pretty much hacked up or sawed up, and that's pretty gory. Besides that, the gore is, you know, minimal. Uh, the characters are really stupid. 
Like, I know I don't complain too much about, like, dumb characters and slashers. I'm a huge fan of the Friday the 13th movies, huge fan of any of those summer camp slashers. And boy, oh boy, did this one make me stop and think, these motherfuckers are dumb. And they, you know what they say about actors? They're not that smart. I, I know from experience, though. Hey, hey, hey. But no, I'm just saying, uh, you know, they're just incredibly stupid characters where they're like, she's like, we gotta go get that nail gun. We're gonna leave you here. Is that alright? She's like, you gonna be okay? She's like, I don't know, but it's okay, go. And it's just like, no, do not leave you here three four people are already dead um also the fact that one people are having sex and somebody gets stabbed from under the bed and the girl just runs out instead of you know having like a weapon i think she had a weapon at the time she, she should have shot under the bed a bunch of times it's just like there's so much shit that like it's just complete stupidity and like i don't want to nitpick it but overall this movie is kind of crummy but entertaining if that makes any sense it's vinegar syndrome remastered it it, do, it looks really good i mean it's a kind of a dark looking film so them remastering it looks a little better of course there's a really really bad scene where a boat explodes and they just throw flames on it and you're like hmm you know I complain about CGI but that ain't cutting it either that ain't cutting it either that's bad but uh <laughs> and it's such a bad scene it's like that's the producer on the boat I'm spoiling the shit out Island of Blood or Who Done It but overall Who Done It is kind of a lackluster slasher entertaining enough I would say if you're a slasher uh you know fanatic and there is a nice little end twist on there and I don't want to say what kind of movie it reminds me of because that'll give it away but as far as the special features we have Blood and Sweaters interview with actor Terrence Goodman Don for an opportunity interview with actor Jim Piper, contain, containing excitement interview with actress Mary Elise Recastner, carrying, cutting a long story short interview with editor uh, Hari Riot, commentary track with Hysteria Continues. Yeah, so it's got a nice features on there. Got a couple decent kills for slasher enthusiasts and completist only. I mean, there's not as many slashers from 82 as 81, but there is some carryover. There's still a couple ticking. I know there's Death Screams and uh, a couple other ones Friday 2 or 3. So there's, there's a handful, and I'm probably going to cover every single fucking one of them. Next Next up is another one from 82. Now, not necessarily a straightforward slasher. It's more of a slasher ghost story, and I think it only gets the, the moniker slasher because it's the woods, but this is the forest. Yeah, so uh, this one is Don Emmons, and I know uh, Don Jones. Sorry, Don Jones and Don Emmons, two different guys. I, I feel like Don Jones did a couple other ones. Oh, he did School Girls and Chains. That's one I know, and this stars Gary Kent. Gary Kent recently passed away, if I'm not mistaken. He is a stuntman actor who is in hundreds of exploitation and horror films and stuff. Just very busy guy. Seemed like a genuine nice guy. Uh, R.I.P. Gary Kent. Uh, he's pretty fun in this. I'd say he's probably the best actor, the best part in the film. So, The Forest. Uh, it opens up with a really beautiful wide shot, you know, of these characters kind of walking across in the forest and a couple of them are picked off. Um, and that scene's pretty solid. A lot, of, a lot of coverage for that scene, actually. They get killed, and as we kind of push forward, we are introduced to kind of uh, two guys, uh, one of which is on the ropes with this old lady. That's probably their words in the movie. And they're having kind of some trouble, marital trouble, and the other guy is, 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 is happily married. So they're like, let's go out camping. And, the, and they start talking to the girls like, you guys would never make it. The girls like, bet us. So they go out first. The guys are supposed to meet them. And of course, the girls go out first. And the guys are trying to get there in time. But they have some car trouble. So they're late. But the girls get there and they realize that something's wrong. Like some some girl, some old, some woman kind of visits them and says, hey. Starts to warn them. Some kids are around. And you're getting a weird idea. Uh, pretty soon they are attacked. One of them is brutally killed. And the guys finally do make it there, but they're too late, obviously. They run into this strange man who is staying in a cave during a rainstorm, and that's Gary Kent, and he starts to kind of talk and feed him a little bit of meat. Um, we know what this meat is, of course, and that, that's a really kind of cool scene in there where the character kind of eats the meat, and he's like registers who he just, maybe subconsciously who he ate. They talk about that in the special features, and I thought that was a nice little touch, kind of a little, Ugh. I think the forest either made one of the section... Maybe, I don't think two, but maybe the section three list, Video Nasties, I don't really think it belongs there. But uh, as it progresses, you know, it's kind of a slow movie thing and it turns into a ghost story. And then we kind of have a flashback to figure out who these ghosts are, how they're related to our killer. And uh, we have a nice little fight scene in the flashback and whatnot. The, the kill count is not ridiculously high. It's only about, you know, including the uh, flashback. There's three kills in the movie. One of which I would say is kind of decent where a character's hung upside down and their throat slit. I would say four. There's actually four. But overall, The Forest is an okay kind of slasher ghost story. A little on the dull side. But, uh, you know, Gary Kent is decent in it. He's solid. He does what he can do. I I like that it's on location. A couple of the shots are nice, but overall the forest is just kind of mediocre slasher film, kind of what you would expect from this kind of deal, uh, slasher ghost story, which is kind of a weird mixture to be brutally honest, but the forest, it's okay. Um, I'm not too off to a great start of 1982, the first three movies, and I'd say Special Silencers is the best of the three, but uh, 
uh, you know, none of them have been offensively bad, so I can deal with this. I can watch movies of this caliber all day long, especially if I haven't seen them before. So that's The Force. As far as special features, we have two commentaries, one with Don Jones and Gary Kent, and the other one with Don Jones and Stuart uh, Asbor Jensen, who is the cinematographer, and we also have a featurette, which had interviews with the director and Gary Kent and some other people. So yeah, it's got some nice features on here from Code Red Blu-ray DVD. Um, yeah. That's that. Okay, so I think it was Tom Brooker who picked my Patreon pick, and he said any shark movie I wanted to watch. So I wanted something light, something fun, something silly, something I hadn't seen. So I picked Shark Night 3D. Okay, I'd heard some good things about Shark Night 3D, and I just wanted something that seemed really silly. It was PG-13. I was like, okay, why not do this one? So I put it in, and it's kind of like definitely from product of its time, that like 2010, 2015, kind of like kids going out, hanging out, college group of kids. I noticed that David Joel or Joel David Moore is in here. I was like, oh, I like that guy. There's a couple other familiar faces, and we have a group of kids, college kids, going out to this kind of secluded, uh, you know, cabin on the lake, of course, and whatnot. Uh, Donald Logue is in here as a cool sheriff who drinks beers. Yeah, that's right. He chugs beers. Um, and right away, the group runs into a couple hillbillies, a couple locals. I guess you wouldn't call them hillbillies. There ain't much hills around here, but a couple rednecks, if you will. And, um, they're kind of no good, stereotypical types, you know, insulting the woman, being gross. And, and of course, our lead actress here, Sarah Paxton, knows, you know, the, the one. They had a history together. So as it progresses, one of the characters is brutally attacked by a shark. Um, in the beginning, that happens as well. And you're like, what in the hell is going on? This is a lake. And soon enough, we realize there's more than one shark. There's all sorts of different kinds of sharks. And here's where the twist comes in. And I don't want to spoil this. So overall, I enjoy the movie. It's fun. It's stupider than shit. It's not realistic, but you'll have a good time if you can get over, you know, the 3D CGI. I think you'll have a good time with Shark Night. I did. So spoiler alert. Um, at first, like, you, 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 you realize these rednecks are going to be a problem, right? Um, and there's only, like, three characters, outside characters introduced besides the group of friends. And all the group of friends are okay you know none of them are offensively annoying they're all decent characters i enjoyed all of them for the most part as some don't get much to do but um as it goes on you know you realize that these two rednecks and, and at first you're like when they realize that something's wrong they're like oh we'll get you guys a ride right away i was like that's refreshing hey they didn't make the rednecks bad guys I'm, i that's a trope that gets very annoying right we're like hey boys you city slickers ain't around here like they can be assholes but sometimes i feel like they need to have like a come to god or like in a serious situation be like all right let, let me give you a ride uh because most people, if they don't like you, if there's a real emergency, they're not going to end up being pieces of shit. They might be so busy they don't care or not notice, but they most likely will be like, let me see what I can do or I'll make a phone call or whatever. Usually it doesn't, you know, it doesn't happen typically that bad. But, uh, like, that's why I had some respect for that new Texas Chainsaw where that guy you think's an asshole, he's a prick. And at the end of the day, you're like, this redneck guy is probably the only halfway decent motherfucker in this movie. Everyone else is a piece of shit. Um, but, uh, as it goes on, like, of course, we learn that the rednecks, this is insanely stupid. Not only the rednecks, but the sheriff, too. They have a snuff film video racket where Shark Week is so popular, they decided to make a bunch of shark snuff films where they film people being eaten by sharks and they set up the circumstances. I can't make this shit up. So you got hammerheads, you got great whites, you got bull sharks, you got little sharks. So basically, a bunch of people are killed by sharks in snuff film wet fashion. And of course, they get killed, too. Donald Logue is fucking hilarious and a great actor, underrated character actor. I remember him in Blade and Grounded for Life. Um, tons of movies confidence. He's always been good. He's always great. Um, honestly, underrated actor. Never turned in a bad performance. Kind of the highlight of the movie. And uh, Joel David Moore. Is it Joel? Is it David Joel Moore or Joel David Moore? Always good too. He's in Hatchet. He's a bunch of stuff. He's in uh, Art School Confidential. All around the cast is solid. The, the gore, CGI, it's fine. I enjoyed myself. I would watch this again. I really would. I liked it. If it was a cheap Blu-ray, I'd buy it. I'd watch it again. Shark Night 3D. It's fun crap, but it's crap, and it knows it's crap. It's not like, hey, this is high art. It is a completely fun modern day, relatively fine movie for anybody to watch. Exploitation flick. Shark Night 3D. Check it out. All right, guys. Let's do these questions and comments and concerns. Ken Coakley. Uh, I recently revisited The Bloody Judge. Unfortunately, not in 4K, but it still looked great to me. It kind of looked like Mark of the Devil had been a Hammer film. Milo Casada, who played Satchel, reminded me of the young Tommy Lee Jones. 
He certainly looked like him. The romantic lead, Hans Haas, looked like a protagonist in a Hammer film. Lee turned in yet another stellar performance. Yeah, you mentioned Lee's versatility to play a protagonist or a villain. One of my favorite performances by Lee was in The Devil Rides Out, which he plays the protagonist. He was also good at comedy acting as well. He did a comedy in 1980. He appeared in a comedy called Serial. He played Martin Mole's boss in the film. He kept talking about being in a motorcycle club. They turned out to be called The Reamers. Lee looked like the heavy metal musician with all denim and leather he was wearing. I love Lee, and he's great in uh, Gremlins, too. He's very funny. You mentioned in last week's comment section that you had never seen the original War of the Worlds. I've seen it many times. My only time seeing it theatrically was back in 2018 in an all-night horror marathon at my local theater. I love 50 sci-fi. The Day the Earth is Still, Invaders from Mars, It Came from Outer Space, Invasion of Body Snatchers, The Fly, When Worlds Collide, Forbidden Planet, Time Machine, um, The Thing from Another World. I've seen every single one of those. Isn't that fucked that I've seen every single one of those movies you've named, but I never saw the original War of the Worlds? Um, the list goes on and on. A lot of them have been re- made but don't add up to the don't add up to the originals yeah i mean i i prefer the original invasion of the body snatchers i do think the fly remake is better but uh that's probably the only one and it's close uh subjective perspective collective maybe i'm biased because to be honest my all-time favorite Fulci, but in my opinion that being the last episode of your 81 series is the best one to date i agree thank you uh, Eddie Daniels, Three Women is my favorite Altman film. Shelley Duvall and Sissy Spacek are excellent. I've been watching this channel for years and writing down your recommendations. I miss going to the video store with my list. I miss going to the video store too. Uh, Brandon Timmons, Bloody Judge is my favorite Franco. He tried his hand at so many subgenres and witch hunting period pieces happens to be one of my favorites. Also, please review Short Shits. Maybe. I'll, I'll try. Uh, Sophie Bongos, The Jar Remaster is insane. I look forward to it. The Nick Mua from Belgium, The Bloody Judge is Sir Christopher Lee at his best as well as one of the best Jess Franco films from his entire body of work. I still chuckle and watching the interview where both uh, gents bristle at the title Night of the Blood Monster. Mr. Lee's films kept getting crappy alternative titles. Remember City of the Living Dead retitled Horror Hotel or with a ring uh, for Doom Service as the tagline? Sometimes the marketing geniuses get it so wrong and hilarity ensues. Questions. Larry Fessenden seems to be a jack of all artistic traits. Do you like his acting more or do you prefer his directing producing? As much as I enjoy his acting, the films he either produces or directs are a more enjoyable experience for me. Also, he was the first to go uh, to give Owen Campbell a sizable role in Bitter Feast. Love Owen Campbell. I think that Larry Fessenden is a great actor. I think he's an okay director. I know I, I mean, he produces great stuff too, but I've yet to fall in love with one of the films he's directed. I've yet to see Habit though, and Habit's the one I really want to see. I do not like Depraved. I don't love No Telling, um, and um, The Last Winter I think's good, but I don't love it. I need to see When to Go and Habit, <clears throat> and I like the Beneath. Beneath was fine as well, but I love his acting. When he pops up in movies just for even a small role, he steals the show. He's just a great character actor. He's fucking phenomenal. Um, Which of the Gates of Hell trilogy is your favorite? There's only two Gates of Hell movies, but my favorite is The Beyond. Uh, Can't wait to see what you have in store for 82. Podcast judging from what came before, it will be excellent. Thank you. Incarnate, Hell's Highway. Finally, I mentioned a few years back that you need to check that out. Hopefully you'll finally get around to it now that you got the fancy Blu-ray of it, which reminds me that I need to still get one. It's a fun watch, and I think you'll get a kick out of it. Thank you. Uh, Amy Adams, Three Women is another classic. It blew me away when I first seen it. It was very interesting. I definitely look forward to rewatching it. I'm going to hop into that update. All right, let's hop into this update. First up from Saturn's Core, Severe Injuries. Yeah, uh, I don't know much about this one. I've been collecting the Saturn's Core line, putting a lot of uh, SOV, kind of bizarre, crazy movies out. So they put out a lot of stuff I really like. So hopefully this one doesn't let me down. Uh, yeah, so I'll probably check that out in 100 years when I get some time. Next up is The Last Slumber Party, which I've heard about for years. It's got a bad reputation, but uh, so did uh, uh, what, Ten Killer, uh, whatever, the Ten Killer. Uh, and I like that one, so geez, maybe I'm just wrong. This is Agfa. Uh, I'm looking forward to checking this one out, and I'm sure that I'll have some jo- enjoyment out of it, honestly. You know, I, I'm not big into the so bad it's good. I just either like them, you know, or I don't like them. You know, I can get some humor out of them, but I don't really subscribe to that so bad it's good kind of shit um here we go we have going south which is uh what the new label from vinegar syndrome the third out of it this has jack nicholson in it directorial sophomore directorial debut sophomore directorial debut that makes sense Dave. but yeah i've never seen this one but i know it's got a good cast in here and i love i remember the cover art the original cover art was just something i always remember with jack nicholson looking there with that weird side smile so looking forward to checking that one out and we have some Vinegar Syndrome stuff here. We have Spectres and a double feature with Maya. Both the same director. These um, I can't remember who did these ones, actually. Uh, these are uh, not Albert T. 
Martino del Martino, are they? Um, but anyways, they're both the same director. I'm looking forward to it. We got Troy Howarth on the special features on these and Nathaniel Thompson. That's great. Love those guys. Obviously had them on the podcast before the show. But uh, yeah, I'm looking forward to watching these. I know they never had good releases, so that's very cool. Then we have Singapore Slang. Man, this movie is nuts. Crazy movie, crazy movie. Singapore Slang is a drink. But, uh, yeah, I've never seen this. I mean, I've seen this one before, but only on, like, an import Blu-ray. Synapse put out the DVD years ago. But, uh, yeah, this one looks really interesting. This is one that I think a lot of people will like. I think this is a cult movie through and through. And finally getting it to an audience is something that it really, truly deserves. It's been a long time. Uh, then we have Dr. T's House of Horrors. We have an Amicus, you know, anthology here. You gotta love Amicus. Suspense that calls it every fiber of your body and soul. We got Cushing, Lee, Sutherland. You got a bunch of people in here. Um, you know, I don't think I've ever actually seen this one. This is a 4K of it. 4 fucking K. That's crazy. Is this the first Amicus 4K? It might very well be. But, uh, yeah, Freddie Francis directed this one. One of my favorite kind of British horror directors. Uh, did Tales from the Crypt and uh, Doctor and the Devils. Last up, we have uh, Story of a Junkie, which, classic, nice t title, right? It overdoses, it loves, it, it loves, it loses. There we go. I know a trauma distributed this a long time ago. So, there we go. I wonder if this, this is more so, I think, I don't think it's a documentary. Uh, I think it may be a, a fake documentary deal or an actual film. Uh, so, it's on flinching study of addiction from multi-award winning uh, documentarian. So, yeah. Any semi-fictionalized, that's what it is. Anyways, we're out of here. Uh, back to the video, guys. All right, guys. Thank you very much for watching. And as always, have a good one. Me.